just never know. You just go along figuring some things don't change ever. Like being able to drive on a public highway without somebody trying to murder you. And then one stupid thing happens. And it's like there you are, right back in the jungle. I was sitting around the office one day looking through scripts continuing to write, trying to get my feature film ideas off the ground, trying to get somebody to hire me. And my assistant, Nona Tyson, found Duel. She said, I read this article, this short story by Richard Matheson in Playboy magazine. I said, what do you think when you read Playboy magazine, Nona? Are you kidding? She said, no, 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 but she said, I love the fiction. And she said, I want you to read the short story. I think this is right up your alley. And I read the short story and I said, wow, this is terrifying. This is like a Hitchcock movie. It's like Psycho with the Birds, only it's on wheels a truck chasing a salesman through the desert. And she said, well, I also found out that Richard Matheson is writing a screenplay that they're going to do as a movie of the week and it's being produced by George Eckstein. She gave me all this information. So I called up George Eckstein, who didn't know me from Adam, knew of me because they used to call me Scheinberg's Folly because I was the young kid he had hired. I think was the youngest person ever signed under a term contract in Universal's history. And I wasn't really that highly regarded. I was this abstract kind of young person that only loved lenses and dolly shots and didn't know anything about acting. That's at least the reputation I had then. And I called George Eckstein up and I said, I've read this short story, haven't read the script yet, I'd love to talk to you about this. And so he invited me over to his office and he asked for me to bring the work I was proudest of so he could see an example of my most recent work. So I brought over the rough cut of Columbo, which hadn't even aired yet, but I brought the rough cut over. And I left him with the rough cut after we had this conversation. He saw the cut, then he called me back to his office and he said, okay, Give me your ideas on how you'd like to make this into a movie. And he gave me the script of Duel. And I read the script, and I came back, had another meeting with George, gave him all my ideas, and he said, well, I'll get back to you. And a day went by, two days went by, I didn't hear a thing. And on the third day, I got a call from George, who said, okay, I'd like you to direct this. I, I was like the greatest phone call. It was the second greatest phone call I ever had. The first thing when Scheinberg called me and got me out of college to, to, to you know, be a director. And the second one was when Eckstein called me and said, I'd like you to direct Duel. And that's sort of how it all began. I was intimately familiar with the work of Richard Matheson because I was a complete, obsessive, compulsive Twilight Zone follower. And so I knew of his work on the Twilight Zone and some of the really great episodes of that. You are getting smaller. Certainly, I'm a big fan of The Incredible Shrinking Man, which he authored. I actually, in one week, got to meet him and Ray Bradbury for the first time, so it was kind of a, a banner week for me. My attraction to it wasn't because it was a horror movie and I didn't really see anything about it as a Western. I thought it was just a complete exercise in a cat and mouth game of classic suspense. And to give credit where credit is due, it's Richard Matheson that was very clear in his teleplay that you didn't see the driver. You might see a hand out the window telling him to go on into oncoming traffic. You might see his boots, but you would never see the face of the driver. That was Richard Matheson. And that attracted me more than anything else. The unseen is always more frightening than what you throw in the audience's face. <laughs> Dennis Weaver was suggested by the studio because he had huge ratings from earlier films on TV. I love Dennis Weaver, and I actually had a vote in it. George Eckstein was actually saying, what do you think of this person? What do you think of that person? And it was great that they did that, because he brought me into the casting circle and let me consult on who the network wanted. And when Dennis's name came up, I immediately said, oh my God, it's gotta be Dennis Weaver. And I just went nuts. And George said, why are you so hot on Dennis Weaver? I said, you never saw Touch of Evil? You never saw the motel caretaker? I'm like, it's the greatest, I went on and on. And I remember George saying, he was pretty good as Chester in Gunsmoke. I said, yeah, that was great, but look at the character roles he played in the movies, because I was a big fan of his from that one film. 
he reached a level of anxiety and panic and touch of evil and paranoia that I envisioned David Mann, the character he was playing in Duel, arriving at in the last act of the story. That's where I wanted him to get to, was that character he played in Touch of Evil. And so when Dennis Weaver said yes, that was like one of the happiest days of my life. I knew I wanted the car to be red because in looking at the locations out in the desert, the desert was pretty much beige and brown and sort of earth colors. And I wanted the car to be able to stand out, be able to pop in all the wide shots of the desert country. And so I just simply said, I don't care what the car is, but I want a red car. What happened was the art director had sort of a casting call for trucks. And I got into a little electric cart and motored back to the back lot. And there were about seven semis waiting for me to kind of cast the star of Duel. And I walked up and down the trucks and and it was obvious the truck I chose because the Peterbilt that I chose was a little more retro, it was an older truck. It had a face, the windows are the eyes, and it has a huge protruding snout, and the grill and the bumper are the mouth, you know, and it had a face. The other trucks that were on the back lot were the more flat nose, blunted trucks, you know, the ones that didn't really form anything but a large kind of conical cab where the window went straight down to the headlights. There was no engine sticking out in front. The engine was probably in the back, if you just tip the cab forward, you could see the engine behind the driver's seat. I think that's how those trucks worked in those days, I'm not sure, but, I, but my eye went right to the one truck and I, I said, you know, you got the part. First of all, I didn't quite know how I was gonna achieve this in 10 days. They were giving me 10 days to shoot about 73 minutes of film with commercials that fills out the hour and a half of the ABC Movie of the Week format. I didn't quite know how I could do this thing in 10 days. They assigned me a highly regarded production manager named Wallace Worsley. And Wallace was kind of gruff and uh, tough. He was a pussycat on the inside, but on the outside, he was a gruff and tough person who looked at me and often gave these derisive snorts of, yeah, prove it, prove you can make this into a movie, because if you can't, your history, son, will bring somebody else in who can. And I really respected that. He took a hard line position with me, because I said to him, I'm gonna shoot this all on location. And he said to me, you cannot shoot a movie of this scale on location in 10 days. You need to send somebody else out to shoot all these plates and do it on a soundstage process. And I said, Wally, I don't want to shoot this if I have to go inside. It's going to look fake. You can look out all the windows of the car. It won't be a chase. It'll be a guy comfortably sitting on a soundstage with bad process out the windows, which is always out of sync with the way the grips move the car. The car moves this way. The process goes that way. It never works. And Wally said, if you spend the first half of the first day of shooting, shooting plates, so we have those banked, and then if you stay on schedule for the first three days, then you can shoot the whole thing on location. Otherwise, you gotta come back to the studio. And I said, okay. And that was the thing I had to prove, that I could stay on schedule. So I didn't have to go back inside to make a real fake looking movie inside. And I did stay on schedule, enough to earn me the right to shoot the whole film outside. And where I did fall behind schedule in the last three or four days was where Wally Worsley said, no one could have done that film in 10 days. We wound up sh shooting that in 12. I went two, maybe 13, I went two or three days over schedule on that, which made the studio not very happy, but I was getting good stuff. Well, I'm never gonna make that appointment now. In order to stay on schedule, I couldn't just do single setups. I knew I had to use multiple cameras. But there's only so many cameras you can put on so many mounts hanging off a car before that starts to look like process. And I wanted a lot of independent movement, so we got Pat Hustis to bring this camera car he invented and designed for the movie Bullet. And he brought this sort of a low racing car, insert car, that I was able to get these really cool low angle shots of the truck and the car. And also was able to plot the shots so I'd put four or five cameras on a mile stretch of road so I would have on one mile run of the truck chasing the car I'd get five run bys they'd be all right to left then I simply took the cameras took them to the other side of the road which by the way looks completely different from the side of the road I was shooting and when you simply just go to the other side of the road and look back the other way I got five more shots when the truck and the car returned to their starting positions that was sort of the way I was able to quickly shoot 
some of the chases in the film. What took time, of course, was when we were on the insert car and we're getting complicated shots moving in and out of the truck, you know, pulling ahead of the truck where the car comes in the shot, letting the car overtake us and going right into the grill and with all the dead bugs that I put into the grill of the truck and splatter dead bugs across the windshield. Things like that took the time, but things like that created the suspense. They said, let's plot the entire 74-minute film on an overhead map so I can just plot my cameras. So we did kind of like a architect's overhead plan of all the highways in Pear Blossom and Soledad Canyon and Sand Canyon out in Palmdale where I shot Duel and put all of these incidents, the cafe, the phone booth and the snake farm, all the incidents or the set pieces along the road of the narrative on this big overhead map, and it was a huge mural. It wrapped around the entire motel room that I was given to stay in for the time I shot on location. But I was able to every single day make notes on the map and plot what the menu was gonna be to achieve that day, the day's work that I needed to achieve in order to stay on schedule and make a really good movie. I was able to do it from a bird's eye view looking straight down. I didn't really so much do individual storyboard frames that would come later in my work, but on this film, that overview really helped me understand where I was. So when I jumped out of continuity, I knew exactly where I was. The truck was the antagonist in the story. It had to have a personality. It couldn't just be a sparkling new, freshly minted truck. So the idea was to make the truck look like a veteran of these, you know, road crimes. This was murder incorporated on wheels. So there was grease on the windows and fake dead bugs put all over the grill and on the windscreen and against the headlights. And the truck was painted oily and streaked with oil coming out of every single possible known vent on the truck. The truck was put into makeup every day. Dennis Weaver was in his makeup chair and the truck had seven or eight people with large brushes and mops, you know, spattering it and making it look really grisly and horrible. It was the same kind of makeup you would do on Frankenstein or The Wolfman or The Phantom of the Opera. All those license plates were the states where he drove motorists into the ground, off cliffs, against guardrails. Those were the notches in his Colt 45. The intention was that he was basically a marauder in every state. 